welcome to the 15th lecture of the online lecture series on language, literature, and cultural studies organized by the English Language Teachers Interaction Forum, ELTIF. Let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Praveen, coordinator of the online programs of ELTIF. Now, Dr. Kartika, a faculty of NIT Trishi, brief you about the programs of ELTIF. Just turning off my video. Oh, yes, please do. Good evening, everyone. Um, ELTIF, as you know, English Language Teachers Interaction Forum, as the name suggests, is a platform for teachers of English to interact, transact knowledge and practices, and thereby enhance their professional and academic skills. Back in 2003, ELTIF began functioning as a radical alternative to the conventional training programs, which traditionally forged the notions of well-informed trainers and ill-informed trainees. To empathetically address the problems and also the possibilities in the teaching of English, ELTIF organizes various programs that ensure interaction among equals by placing great value on the concept of equity in educational practices. We at ELTIF discuss how we academically personalize our classrooms and elaborate on how these practices could be transferred or translated into different contexts. It is this holistic approach that invited not only teachers, researchers and students, but also the parents celebrating the triangle of meaningful educational practices. The practices, problems and solutions that are discussed here at LTIF take shape into the theoretical framework, usually at various national and international conferences that we organize. The village-friendly programs which we held in various parts of Kerala witness teachers and educational practitioners from diverse, different cultural contexts coming together, offering skill-based sessions to stakeholders of various age groups, including children, women, and students of higher educational institutions. LTIF emphasized its social and ethical commitment through empowering human life by transforming the Gandhian thought into its motto, empowering rural India through English education. Even during these tough times of pandemic, the Journal of LTIF never missed an edition thanks to the efforts of the president, Professor Bhaskaran Nair, and the effective teamwork behind it. Thank you for extending your solidarity, and I welcome you all to LTIF. Thank you. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Krishnan, formerly of Mahatma Gandhi University, Kotem, who will be delivering a lecture entitled The Bright Book of Life, Some Reflections on Narrative Fiction. Ms. Bhagalakshmi, who is a faculty of Bharati Dasan College for Women, Puducherry. She will now introduce the speaker. A very good evening to one and all. It is really an honor and privilege to welcome and introduce Professor K.M. Krishnan on behalf of ELTIF. Professor K.M. Krishnan, Krishnan Marsh, as we fondly call him, is a scholar par excellence and an extremely humble human being. He has profound knowledge and expertise in so many areas, including fiction studies, critical theory and cultural studies, popular and specialization culture, classical art forms and translation. To give a brief introduction to his illustrious career as an academician, Professor K.M. Krishnan completed MA and PhD from Calcutta University. He joined as a lecturer in School of Letters, Mahatma Gandhi University, Kerala in 1991 and retired recently as the director of the School of Letters. He also served as a member of the Board of Studies to many universities and as a syndicate member of MG University. He continues his service as the Dean Faculty of Language and Literature, Mahatma Gandhi University. He has so many exemplary publications and presentations, both in Malayalam and English to his credit. He's also a widely acclaimed translator and literary critic. Some of his noted translation are Bath's essay, Death of the Order, Vikram Chandra's work of fiction, Love and Longing in Bombay, Balamani Amma's Malvinda Kada, etc. Two of his recent publications are targeting the source, a reading of fiction in a multilingual society with special reference to Anand and V.T. Came, which is an introduction to the English translation of the autobiography of V.T. Bhattadiripada, My Dreams, My Tears. 
Apart from being an accomplished academician, he has demonstrated his prowess as an actor and sir is also a good singer. As a student of Krishnan sir, I would like to add that he's a guru, a sahardaya, a guide and a role model to many who is an academician we all look up to. It is really our privilege to have you with us sir. We welcome you sir to the 15th online lecture of LTIF and over to you sir. In fact, I, I think I must begin with an apology. Uh, the office bearers of LTIF have been actually intimating me about uh, the various uh, lecture programs being organized by LTIF over the last several months. Uh, but then uh, uh, thanks to a series of uh, lectures and programs being organized in connection with my retirement and of course in several other preoccupations I was not able to listen to any one of them. In fact, I, I feel that I actually have missed quite a, a number of very important um, lectures. Uh, thanks again for uh, inviting me to deliver a lecture under the aegis of LTIF. I must definitely thank the, the organizers and the office bearers of LTIF. And I should also thank uh, Bhagya Lakshmi uh, for giving uh, such a superlative uh, kind of introduction uh, to me, to my uh, humble little contributions to English and literary studies. Uh, when Dr. Bhaskar and I suggested um, or invited me, asked me to uh, to give a lecture. In fact, I was not sure what to talk about. Um, and then also, I was not really uh, sure about the kind of audience that I was supposed to be, I was uh, addressing today. And I came to understand that they are basically students of literature. And I thought, in which case I can talk about an area in which I have done some work. Uh, even though I'm absolutely sure that many of the things that I would talk, I'll be talking about this evening, um, uh, definitely many of you would be, be familiar with. Um, so that way too, I must that way begin with an apology for repeating what you already know. Uh, the title of uh, the lecture or the presentation that I'm giving uh, is, uh, I have uh, titled my presentation, The Bright Book of Life, Some Reflections on Narrative Fiction, which would be basically uh, some of my reflections on the novel primarily. Some of these might sound a little elementary as I have already indicated, but there uh, in fact, I have chosen the title of my presentation from uh, the title of an essay written by D. H. Lawrence. Uh, no, not exactly the title of an essay, but a remark that or an expression that he used uh, in the essay that he wrote regarding the structure of the novel. Why the novel matters. That happens to be the title of the essay that he wrote, uh, in which this particular expression appears. In fact, he describes the novel as the bright book of life. But I think uh, it is necessary that we have to go into uh, you know, some of the intricacies of the way in which probably the novel has evolved over the years and its, um, its, its kind of relationship with what probably the is meant by the word the bright book of life. In fact, we, we can see that uh, the expression the bright book of life has been used by several other scholars as well uh, in, in their analysis, in their studies, and also even as the title of their books as well. If you look at the history of uh, the theory of the novel, you can see that maybe one of the earliest accounts of, or one of the earliest attempts at theorizing the novel came from uh, George Lukács, who in the 1910s, more than 100 years ago, um, in what he himself admits as a pre-Marxist uh, study, a theoretical attempt at theorizing the novel. Uh, in the theory of the novel, uh, he 
probably put across some of the, um, the early attempts at theorizing the novel. If you, again, I suppose the title of the, the work itself, The Theory of the Novel, would probably be one of the earliest books to use the word theory. Maybe one of the first theories of a genre, a form of writing, The Theory of the Novel, uh, in which he introduced uh, the novel, or he defined the novel in a very peculiar kind of way. Uh, in a way, uh, only probably he is capable of. So his argument basically was that uh, the, the novel is the quintessential literary form of the modern world. In fact, it makes a kind of a distinction between the old world, what's been called the ancient regime, and the new world. Probably the world inaugurated by, the new world inaugurated by Renaissance and Enlightenment, and of course, all the uh, all the consequent and subsequent kind of developments uh, in, uh, in, uh, in not only in the, the way in which the people thought, but also the way in which the people looked upon the world uh, and tried to logically make sense of the world. So that is probably the, the theory that we usually refer to as that. So what he argues is that why the epic in a way represented the quintessential literary form of the Anzian regime, the old world, uh, in which uh, the world, in a way, was a kind of an unproblematic one. In contrast, in the modern world, of which the fiction, of which fiction or the novel, uh, would be the representative of the quintessential literary form. The structure itself is a uh, uh, rather complex and complicated. So here, he also argues that uh, the novel can be defined as the literary form of uh, a world abandoned by God. So what you see there is primarily the, the philosophical principle in the way which defined the modern world. How a world which was considered until then in a way governed by God, faith belief was in a way replaced by maybe a shift in focus to everything that is human, a world governed by uh, human beings or man, a world which man sought and uh, sought to in a way make, make sense of and also was in a position to, uh, to, to define and logically explain to the, uh, to the world. So that way, uh, the novel came to be recognized or understood or can be defined as the literary form of the modern world, the epic of a world abandoned by God. In fact, I used the term epic for another reason as well. Or I use this particular uh, definition for another reason as well. Those who have read Henry Fields, Fielding's Joseph Andrews would remember that uh, in the preface to the novel, uh, he defines, uh, as we all know, Richardson, um, Henry Fielding, and uh, Daniel Defoe are generally considered as the first three novelists in the English language. Uh, and many consider Joseph Andrews, sorry, Henry Fielding as a, many consider uh, as, a, a, as a novelist superior uh, to uh, his Richardson. Well, uh, that is not a point to be debated here. So Henry Fielding in the preface to Joseph Andrews describes his own work as a comic epic poem in prose. Again, uh, this is again a very famous remark, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. But what did probably he mean by that? Or probably uh, how the, what, what could be the way in which we can try to make sense of this particular definition of the novel as a comic epic poem in prose. Uh, for one thing, uh, Henry Fielding wanted this new form of writing, which later came to be described as the novel or known as the novel, to be accepted by the reading public. And by this time we know, by the 18th century we know, 
that what can be called a reading public had already come into existence in England and which had already become a highly literate country as well. So he wanted his work to be accepted by, uh, read by the general reading public. Uh, to ensure this, he described this as a comic epic poem in prose. Because epic was one of the forms of writing. There are, of course, a number of reasons for using the term epic, perhaps. Uh, epic was a form of writing which the people were familiar with. While uh, to attract the, the, the readers uh, into his own work, he wanted to underline the presence of an element of the comic in it as well. And he also, once again, ironically, perhaps, when we look back, described it as an epic poem in prose. We all know that epics or the form of writing called the epic has been described as a, 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 a poetic form. Uh, so in order to ensure the acceptance of the reading public, um, or in order to ensure that the reading public would accept his, uh, his new form of writing, his new uh, work of literature, he had to describe it, he had to in a way, introduce this work um, uh, in such a fashion. But he had to definitely, very importantly, he also had to highlight uh, the fact that it was written in prose. So this, in a way, brings us to another important aspect of literary production and deception. We knew that the history of literature is in a way a history of the production and reception of literature as well. In earlier or classical times, what we now understand or what we now describe as literature used to be uh, maybe produced in public and not meant to be published and read by a reading public. Uh, they were mostly in the form of plays which were you know, performed on the stage or epics which were also uh, maybe performed by storytellers. Um, okay, so the, the texts of those works of literature used to be passed on from maybe generation to generation through these performers on the stage. While it definitely took some time and also some improvement and also technology to allow prose literature to flourish. We know that there was some you know, prose literature uh, even in the medieval times and all, but prose literature in the real sense of the term, in large number, in large quantity, came to be produced only in the modern period. And this was made possible with the advent of, with the introduction of the printing press. Because for prose literature, to be produced, to flourish, and to become a part of the regular maybe reading habit of the reading public, it definitely had to take a, a definitive form, and which was maybe made possible by, which was ensured by the printing press, and of course, the, the publishing industry, which flourished uh, in the 17th, primarily in the 17th and 18th centuries, as we all know. Uh, which is also definitely related to uh, the advent of the growth of modernity as well. And also, yeah, maybe the, that is another point that we need to uh, at least briefly discuss. Even as the novel has been described as the literary form of the modern world, even as the novel has been described as the literary form of the, the era which was dominated by the human being or man, uh, the novel has also been described as the literary form of the middle class uh, and also a form of writing which saw maybe the shifting of the setting from the rural to the urban. Again, this is an area uh, that one can uh, in a way discuss at length, maybe a uh, la or following uh, the, the tradition or following uh, the, the, the kind of initiative uh, 
uh, or the, 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 the or uh, if you uh, look at uh, the work, the remarkable work done by the likes of Sir Raymond Williams and all. Probably we can come back to uh, that a little. Yeah. Uh, what are the ways in which we can look at uh, literature? Sorry, uh, the novel. The novel, as the name indicates, as we all know, uh, is considered as the as a, a modern, a, a new form of writing. Even the the word novel means the new. It's a new form of writing in prose, and we all know that among the forms of literature, the novel is definitely the most popular one. Uh, it has probably the largest following as far as uh, the number of uh, people who read it, as far as the size of the reading public is concerned. The novel has also been described, uh, described as a, an inclusive form. What do we mean by that? If you look at the evolution, the history of the novel, uh, across the 18th and 19th centuries, we can see a number of um, changes taking place uh, as far as the structure is concerned. We are definitely going back to the structure of the novel a little later. Um, but uh, in the way in which the novel came to be organized, the way in which the shape of the no novel came to be, in the way it came to, to crystallize, maybe over a period of 150 years, in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, particularly uh, with its relationship with the periodical magazines and also the kind of impact that it had over the structure of the novel. All these things can be uh, looked at, discussed in some detail. For those who are interested in that, uh, there is a wonderful work titled Popular Fictions, uh, edited by three, uh, three scholars, Paul Stigand, Peter Widowson, and one more person. I don't exactly remember the right now. I don't remember the name of the third person. Um, so if you look at the history of the evolution of the novel over these years, we can also see uh, that as it happens to be uh, a very popular form of writing, it also sought to bring in as many elements as possible, as probably uh, you know, narrative literature in writing could possibly accommodate. And what are these different forms? There are those who argue, uh, like I, I suppose it was uh, Percy Labak in the craft of fiction, or even Walter Allen, uh, the one who wrote the English novel, A Short History. Uh, many of those scholars have argued that there is even a little bit of the, of, uh, the dramatic or even Shakespeare in the novel. Uh, you would definitely come across many novels which still retain an element of the, the dramatic in them in the introduction of the characters uh, or in the delineation of the various aspects of elements of uh, the story. Uh, you may have, those who have read, those who are in the habit of reading uh, Malayalam literature would remember that a novel like say Indulekha is, uh, is at the same time a, a play as well. It is written almost like a, a play, but I, I haven't at least come across any novel which is written like in the letter, uh, a novel which is written in the form of conversation, mostly conversations. Uh, I definitely would um, appreciate any kind of feedback uh, on this particular comment. Um, if you read the works of, say, Dostoevsky, for instance, you would find uh, long passages written in verse. There are also uh, a number of, though not large number, there are also a number of works which are also written in verse as well. Novel is written in verse. So that way, uh, the variety uh, of styles and structures and linguistic experiments that the novel form has 
uh, adapt it or adopt it would definitely uh, amaze it. Uh, I should uh, say that. So that way, the novel has been described as an inclusive form. And it remained the most inclusive form, bringing in as many elements as possible, as many elements as prose narratives would allow to be accommodated. Uh, it continued like that until probably the advent of cinema, which practically replaced the novel, not only in being the more inclusive uh, form, probably not a literal form, but a form of art, uh, which could uh, accommodate maybe a couple of more languages into it. Another aspect which has been repeatedly highlighted by series of uh, the novel uh, um, is the kind of importance given to the individual. Uh, there are those who argue that the modern era, the modern age, uh, is also the age of the individual. The age which allowed the individual to recognize himself or herself. The age uh, in which some even argue that the man was born. The man, the, the unique individual who saw himself or maybe herself uh, against maybe the society, uh, the state, the other people, the family, uh, or within which or of which uh, he or she was a uh, part. So the uniqueness of the individual was in a way recognized during the modern period. And many people that we associate uh, the rise of the novel as also the rise of the, the literary form of the, the, the form that represents the individual's concerns. Um, okay. In fact, the, the, the use of the expression, the rise of the novel, reminded me of uh, work, maybe one of the foremost um, historical and theoretical works on the history of the novel, uh, the rise of the novel by Ian Watt. You are all familiar with that. Uh, now, uh, again, a brief look at the different types of novels. Uh, I hope these may not sound uh, a little trite and elementary. Uh, we have to begin with the epistolary novel. We, we also have to make a mention of these things uh, because uh, some of the experimental forms of uh, narrative uh, need to be related to some of the early uh, methods of uh, novel writing. One of the earliest models of the English novel, as we all know, Pamela, uh, was written as an epistolary novel, which everyone knows is a novel written in the form of uh, either letters or entries in a diary or some other document uh, which completed the telling of a story as Eagleton, Terry Eagleton in uh, the English novel, an introduction would say, uh, a form of writing uh, in which the novel was completed without a meta narrative, without probably a a narrator telling a story, the entire story being told uh, in a mimetic kind of fashion, uh, using the words of characters or using some documents uh, without anyone actually uh, diegetically telling the story. Uh, I'm sure you know uh, the, the, the difference between the mimetic and diegetic modes of telling stories. Uh, and if you look at the history of the novel in any language for that matter, you can see that many of the early novels uh, were in the form of individual biographies, which told the stories of individuals. Even now, there is a lot of focus on the individual. The practice of naming or giving names of characters as titles to the, to the novels, uh, I suppose, has uh, been in a way um, uh, 
or discontinue. Uh, they think of other more striking titles to their names. But then uh, the fact that these novels were written in the form of individual biographies would probably uh, give you uh, uh, the kind of justification for treating or considering uh, the, the, the novel as the story of or as the representation of the uh, individual subject. So, which is in a way justified by the titles of the early novels. And some of the early titles are extremely interesting as well. They are more in the form of summaries of the entire novels. And there are also um, forms of novels which probably ensured a continued readership for the form, uh, form of writing uh, which took root uh, or which flourished in the late 19th century and used to be very popular, the detective novels or the uh, or a form of writing which has also been uh, described as tales of racial simulation. Now, of course, I have mentioned the name of Poe, even though he is not very well known as a uh, novelist. I think he has written only one novel. He didn't actually believe in long narratives at all. And here we have a very interesting uh, category of novel, old of test novels. Earlier, I spoke of um, the remark made by Henry Fielding, who described his own novel as the comic epic poem in prose, which was in a way an attempt to convince the people that there was something in my writing which they could uh, accept. That was also a method uh, by which he ensured a particular kind of uh, method of reading as well of the novel. While in old oak chess novels, we see a related yet different tradition for an attempt to ensure readership for the novels or to ensure a certain kind of authenticity for the novel. The old oak chess novels are novels which in a way grew out of uh, a document which the author claimed he very rarely she, he had come across uh, in an old chest, which forms in a way the basis for this particular narrative to which I as the author have added only uh, some stylistic features. Um, Perhaps in it, we can see uh, maybe some of the early forms of what later on uh, possibly uh, inspired writers to write historical novels as well. Uh, a form of writing which had some kind of a grounding in reality as well. Incidentally, that reminds me that there are several uh, scholars, including some of the very recent ones, who argue that the novel continues to be, uh, even though a problematic uh, one, a representation of the actual experiences of human uh, beings. In a way, justifying uh, the title or the expression used by D.H. Lawrence, a bright book of life, or even uh, Ian Watt, what Ian Watt would describe as the circumference of reality. The structure of the novel was, in a way, defined as the Circumference of reality by uh, Ian. Uh, the realist uh, novels. Okay. I've taken exactly minutes. Um, uh, I, I don't intend to uh, dwell at length on the realist novels, which we all know is probably the most popular tradition within. Uh, uh, within this genre called the novel. Uh, the realist, uh, in a way, there are people who even argue that all novels are realist novels. Uh, in that, the novel has always retained its connection with reality. But remember that realism is only a technique that gives you some kind of a 
an illusionistic feeling that one is experiencing reality. Realism is not reality. That is the point that we, as students of literature, we always have to keep in mind. Uh, there are any number of theories of realism. There are also theories of the flight from realism as well. Uh, I would only name a person uh, and who has given one of the finest and convincing uh, sort of definitions of set of definitions of uh, what he himself describes as the classic realist novel. The classic realist novel. Even within realism, there are, uh, as we all know, there are different categories or divisions uh, like socialist realism, magical realism, and all. Uh, but in classic realist uh, novels, Emil Benveniste, Emil Benveniste, a French linguist uh, and also a theorist of fiction, uh, has sort of said, carted out three distinctive features, uh, of which one of them is uh, effacing of textuality. I'm not going into the details of it, but uh, I would just like to mention that. Uh, realist novels gave you the illusionistic feeling that one is experiencing or you are experiencing reality. Uh, while the other stylistic or linguistic aspects of the novel would remain largely unseen by the reader. So that is what the realist novel in a way ensures. That is why. Um, Emil Benviste argues that one of the significant uh, features of realist novel is the facing of textuality. Uh, the, 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 the specific feature of textuality that is um, very much present there in these novels would be effaced, would uh, go out of sight. Now I have only listed a few names uh, that I have already mentioned. Uh, uh, now, coming to other forms of writing historical novels, we have the example of several people. And remember that even there are also those who believe, those who argue that all novels are historical novels. And when such a statement is made, uh, these people definitely do not have historical novels like the ones written by um, Sir Walter Scott in mind. But they are hinting at the ways in which the novel has succeeded in capturing, representing reality in modern times. How even the language uh, used in the novels come as close to the language that was in day-to-day -day, uh, life. And maybe multiple ways in which the, uh, the novel, in a way, makes its mark in history. It is in this sense that uh, the, uh, the, the remark that all novels are historical novels to be uh, Another very interesting um, you know, school of writing within the novel is the, the adventure stories that grew into, prominent, grew into prominence in the late 19th century. I don't want to go into the details of uh, uh, such a very popular form of writing but would rather draw your attention to maybe a related area, the utopias and dystopias. Uh, I, I cannot uh, perhaps uh, help discussing a novel like the Alvaro style, especially after invoking the statement that all novels are historical novels. Uh, in works like Gulliver's Travels and maybe several other works of the 18th and 19th centuries, what one sees, even as um, the author makes use of the individual biography mode, even as the, the, the author uh, makes use of the, the novelistic narrative, the first person narrative of a novel, we can see that he creates a rather allegorical kind of uh, 
uh, uh, allegorical kind of space uh, within which he uh, constructs a particular kind of life world, which is in a way autonomous in itself. Uh, and there is a very famous statement that Gulliver makes towards the, or maybe in the, the beginning of the novel, uh, which uh, in a way uh, announces his dislike of man. Uh, he, I don't exactly remember the the the, uh, the quote, but what he says is that I like uh, he names a few individuals, but I positively dislike this species called man. That is very evident in some of the characterizations in the, in the novel as well. Uh, so in Gulliver's travels, what you see is a form of utopia, which is in a way an expression of the distrust or dislike um, of uh, the new dispensation that is coming into being. With the world being governed by science, governed by logic, governed by man, and a new um, new world merging. Uh, 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 a new world emerging and a certain kind of reaction against this new dispensation, what it means for the individual and all. All these get represented in works like the reverse travels. That is how I would like to look at it. And in creating a space within which uh, an independent, autonomous uh, life world comes into being, or is uh, you know is uh, made to, or he creates a, a kind of a uh, a very uh, autonomous kind of life world uh, in the four islands that he visits. Uh, he was uh, probably talking of a system that is non-existent. We know that utopias are non-existent ideal worlds, while dystopias are in a way non-existent uh, worlds which are uh, you know, completely and disagreeable, the world that you do not want to, to come into being at all. So dystopias are in a way reactions against the, the kind of a bright new world that many people thought was coming into uh, being. While many writers found it um, extremely difficult to accept. And novels like the ghost travels are a result of that. And yeah, we have already discussed the realist novel of the 19th century, which was never replaced by, uh, see, I, I'm not actually giving you a history of the novel, but only some 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 schools of writing, uh, which in a way defined the different ways in which the novels could be attempted, the novels could be written, including the modernist novel. So while talking of the modernist novel, I, I don't intend to discuss the, the stream of consciousness and other, uh, methods that these writers had employed. Uh, but I would like to draw your attention to another statement uh, which was made in the context of uh, works which were written probably between the two wars, the First and the Second World War in the 20th century, uh, which sort of announced the death of the novel. Um, reading the works of James Joyce and Virginia Woolf. Um, extremely intimidating as they were because of the, uh, the style, uh, the language, the content, uh, the, the, the thematic content, as also the size, perhaps. Um, the kind of attraction that the earlier novel, realist novels held for the ordinary reading public. Um, was in a way lost. And there were those who believed that uh, the novel was dead. But the statement the novel was dead does not that way announce the actual death of the novel. But in a way, it uh, announced the death of the traditional novel in which the individual, the individual 
uh, of course, you know, we have individuals in Joyce and Wood, but not the kind of unique individual that you came across in earlier realist novels. Maybe this is a point that we can debate. Uh, now we, we come to probably the, the more recent kind of uh, you know, experiments as also uh, uh, contributions uh, into the field of the novel. Uh, uh, there are those who there are the theories there are theories who believe that towards the end of the 19th century we are we are already discussing the 20th century towards the end of the 19th century the sensibility that you know, we governed the entire western world underwent a certain kind of shift from what can be called the the mimetic to the digestive from a focus on the subject matter to the form in which uh, the subject matter was dealt with in literature. In fact, this is a remark, or this is an observation that can be applied to any form of artistic creation, including the novel. And that is in the way what we see even in D.H. Lawrence and several other transitional writers, those who represented the transition from the realist to the modernist fiction. So the shift can be in a way described as the shift into a kind of a recognition of the autonomy of the literary form. And that is in a way what we see even in Joyce and Wolf and several other writers. Uh, but at the same time, a much more pronounced and conscious kind of uh, invocation of the stylistic of the compositional and of the um, of this uh, of the linguistic can be seen in what can be called post modernist uh, novelistic uh, experiments or contributions um, they became increasingly self reflexive so while earlier forms of writing uh, claimed to represent reality through the medium of language, more recent forms of fiction, they maybe gave greater focus onto or laid greater focus onto the linguistic, to the stylistic. Again, this is again a very uh, sweeping kind of remark, uh, which uh, I, I should definitely admit um, sort of um, does not address several other issues which make it actually a little more complex. So in works by the likes of the John Barth, uh, in a, a novel like The Letters, we see that. In Italo Calvino, we see an increasing ref self-reflexivity, wherein uh, even the, the subject matter of the novel itself would be the way in which a novel comes into being. The recognition that, and also the admission that this is a work of art, or the textuality is not no longer being effaced, as we saw in the case of realist novels uh, earlier, or a work like, say, Walter Abish's Alphabetical Africa, a very uh, uniquely experimental kind of novel. Well, uh, in fact, I have had it right. Is as well into this list, even though it actually does not belong to the uh, to the postmodernist uh, typical mainstream postmodernist writers. He, he is a person of color, and that way he brings another tradition within fiction writing, which also sees uh, the novelist addressing issues of identity and subjectivity. Um, and in a way that reminds me uh, of a remark, uh, which definitely can be looked at in a, uh, in a problematic kind of way. So it can as well be problematized. A remark made by Walter Allen. We have already uh, discussed novels written in various languages. Um, Ellison himself being an American author who wrote his works in English. Uh, but who wrote the story of a colored person. 
Um, so what Walter Allen said, yeah. Uh, so Walter Allen argues that why uh, the English novel, uh, maybe this comes into, maybe into conflict with some of the remarks made by us earlier. Uh, Walter Allen argues that while the English novel, the British novel, of course, uh, focused mainly on questions of class, uh, focused more on issues relating to the individual. That's again a remark that he made, uh, even though um, several statements, maybe this is the contrary, have already been made by me in my uh, discussion on several uh, English, European, and even American uh, novelists. Uh, I conclude my basic lecture here, but I would uh, like to just draw your attention uh, because Dr. Bhaskar and I had, uh, had asked me uh, to uh, also discuss maybe some of the ways in which the novel can be discussed and addressed in, a, in a, an actual classroom kind of situation. I, I don't intend to dwell again at length on that, but would like to draw the attention of maybe prospective teachers of literature to maybe just one of the ways in which uh, you can use the, the text of the novel inside the classroom. Probably the same way in which you would use a poem or you would use a play. We know that uh, we won't be able to discuss uh, an entire novel inside the classroom um, in such detail as when we discuss a poem. But th this is probably one of the ways. In fact, even I was inspired uh, into choosing this particular novel and also choosing this particular example uh, by, uh, again, a great scholar, Peter Mathieson. I'm sure you have heard about him, those uh, you know, American literature students will definitely remember American Renaissance, maybe the foremost. Uh, you know, theoretical and critical work on American fiction, uh, in which uh, he drew my attention to one uh, you know, specific aspect, structural aspect of the novel, uh, The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I, I'm just reading out a small portion uh, from the novel, in the beginning, the, the chapter one. Incidentally, this is also a novel which makes use of the old Oxist tradition, uh, in which uh, Hawthorne claimed that he had accidentally come across a document in the custom house uh, which contained uh, the text of this particular story, which he maybe improved uh, rather stylistically to make it a. Uh, yeah, I'm just reading out uh, maybe a couple of sentences here. Uh, the title of chapter one of the novel is The Prison Door. So in a way, uh, our attention is in a way visually drawn to the prison door um, or the, the surroundings of the prison. Uh, and he continues the description. Before this ugly edifice and between it and the wheel track of the street. So you look at the, the use of the words and how uh, visual the entire description is. It was a grass plot, much overgrown with burdock, pigweed, apple peru, and such unsightly vegetation. And look at the details. And which evidently found something congenial in the soil that had so early borne the black flower of civilized society. Again, look at the way in which he uses the color scheme uh, in contrast to the flowers and also the the, the, the the raw nature of the vegetation around the prison. In fact, what you see in the novel is in a way the evolution of a person from uh, a, a very uncouth into a much more sophisticated one and a person who is being accept, accepted by the society. And uh, we have a metaphorical kind of recreation of that evolution right across the novel and which is again evident in even in the choice of the metaphors uh, in it. Born the black flower of civilized society at prison. 
So the prison is described as a black flower of a civilized society. But on one side of the portal and rooted almost at the threshold was a wild rose bush. See, look at the contrast. Uh, one is again reminded of one of the scenes in Tess of Durbervilles, uh, in which rather unobtrusively, the color red uh, is being introduced uh, into our uh, attention or drawn to our attention. Um, they are rather startling, you should say. A wild rose bush covered in this month of June with its delicate gems, which might be imagined to offer their fragrance and fragile beauty to the prisoner as he went in. And to the, uh, this, as he went in, he is not a specific person, any prisoner for that matter. But the contrast between the prison life and the free world outside, the, the rawness, and in contrast to the much more sophisticated and also the delicateness of the, the central character in the novel. All these contrasts are very beautifully brought out by the novelist, uh, picking and choosing each and every word and uh, metaphor in the process. Um, fragrance and fragile beauty. Again, look at the alliteration. Fragrance and fragile beauty to the prisoner as he went in and to the condemned criminal as he came forth to his doom in token that the deep heart of nature, the deep heart of nature could pity and be kind to him. And in a way, that is the, the thematic concern of the entire novel, how in a way even nature comes to the rescue of a uh, person or nature plays a, an instrumental kind of role in the emancipation of uh, the central character in the novel. Oh, in fact, I, I just want, I would conclude with maybe a few more remarks, I'm sorry. Uh, there are novels which make use of multiple points of view, multiple narrators as well. Uh, I would just, uh, you know, maybe remind you of a remark made by, I suppose it was James Joyce himself, who talks about the novel which employs third person narration, uh, in which he says the author would stand outside the text like the God of creation, tearing his fingernails. They are such words which employ, make use of meta narratives to a maximum, and in which probably the mimetic narration, narration done by the characters, would be minimum. While there are also stories which are told by the first persons. We also know that there are also novels which make use of both. There are also novels which make use of frame narratives within which are contained several layers of narratives, as we say in uh, Emily, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, uh, maybe one of the most famous examples of multivalent narration, as uh, who was the person who wrote the, the, the work on multivalent narration? Dorothy Van Gent. Dorothy Van Gent talks about the multivalent narration, uh, especially in the context of uh, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. Uh, now, I, I conclude uh, with uh, a form of writing, a form of the novel, which does not have any fictional content in it at all. Fiction and novel have been used rather you know, synonymously, uh, as though fiction actually meant the novel. While we know that there are examples of, even though there aren't a large number of examples of, but there are examples of novels which are written in the form of novels, but without any uh, content of fiction in it. Or novels which are written with actual character, actual persons, and actual incidents, and possibly even actual conversations, um, forming the central, maybe narrative core. Uh, we don't have many examples of it, uh, but there are writers like, say, Hunter S. Thompson, an American author, uh, Norman Naylor, who has experimented with nonfiction novel, and Truman Capote, 
Of course, you know, there are also a few others, Truman Capote, and who has written one of the most famous nonfiction novels in Cold Blood. Uh, even uh, Mailer's The Executioner's Song uh, or The Armies of the Night. Armies of the Night, uh, the title is actually taken from um, Whitman, Armies of the Night, but which again tells the story of a of a, a procession, a demonstration, written in the form of a novel. And he has given the subtitle, uh, Novel as History and History as Novel. Uh, I, I do not actually conclude here, but I uh, conclude in the sense, I, I do not make a concluding statement here, uh, but I uh, conclude my presentation here. And uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, we okay. will now move on to the question answer session now. Sir, I have a question, sir. Know that the applied tag, a uh, new gen uh, learners or new gen students, uh, they prefer movies instead of uh, reading big, big novels. They are very familiar with the character, setting, plot of these novels. Well, usually, is... usually when films are made from novels, yeah. uh, they you know, bring about uh, structural changes to it. Yeah. Many of the characters are usually omitted. Uh, even the settings, uh, you know, all the scenes are usually not recreated. Uh, thanks to limitations of uh, you know, space and all. We know that the, the novel is not only an inclusive form. Uh, novel is also a very flexible kind of form. You have novels which are maybe 3,000, 4,000 pages long. Yeah. While there are also novels like uh, The Old Man and the Sea, which is you know, less than 100 pages in length. So that way, the novel is also very flexible. While when these novels are made into movies, um, maybe only the central thematic core is being recreated. So I don't exactly understand how you can say that all the set, all the settings, all the characters, the, the, or the students are familiar with all the setting and the characters. Um, yeah, seeing is believing, they say. Uh, visual representation is much more uh, you know, attractive and it would probably leave a more lasting impression on their minds than the written page. Uh, and they can also, they also have the facility to watch it multiple times. Uh, that is probably another reason. To read a novel uh, two times or three times is not easy. We all know that. In fact, we I don't have an answer to this particular question. Uh, how can we instill that uh, uh, reading of a fiction in, in our students? If you, if, you, if you get an, an, an answer to this particular, particular question, a solution to this problem, uh, please let me know on that. I would like to <laughs> to, to, to make my son also start reading. Well, you know. How can we deal with the magic realism in, in our uh, novels? How can we approach that? Uh... Well, as far as the actual discussion of a magical realist work within a classroom situation, I don't think there is any, any difference that way. Any difference between uh, the way you discuss uh, any other novel for that matter. But then, you can also keep in mind, I suppose, a remark made by, uh, by Salman Rushdie. Realism, in a way, is closer to reality. So even magical realism, that way, is some representation of reality. So what he argues is that uh, the idea or the notion of the real uh, for post-colonial nations is different from the idea of the real for the Western Nations. So the way in which realist novel has evolved or developed in the West may be different from the way in which uh, realist novel can evolve or develop in the post-colonial uh, situation, cultural situation. So many elements which are logically not acceptable to the Western society might be very much a part of the cultural life of countries like cultures like India or any other post-colonial nation for that matter. So it could be only in relation to, remember, uh, I, I, I remember one particular example of, I am trying to relate these two questions. 
of a a film which was based on one single episode in 100 years of solitude by markets uh, a film was made a, a very fine film uh, and interestingly this particular episode concerns uh, an estate uh, in the novel in which uh, there was a, a kind of a revolutionary kind of mutiny in which a number of people died and the film uh, a documentary film uh, made by a british author british maker interviewed several people who were actually involved in it and one of the persons who he said to have actually fired the shots the policeman fired the shots um, gave this particular answer to the question uh, it is said in the novel that nearly 3000 people died for people were killed while this policeman argues that only 30 people were killed and his justification is that only 30 people were killed but then marquez is such a great man he has a religious imagination so he can very easily transform 30 into 3000 so maybe that is one way in which in post colonial nations um, we don't know what real reality is yeah. whether only 30 people died or 3000 people died ultimately in literature it's only uh, language that matters you can see so that is the one way in which uh, you can tackle issues yeah, yes sir. Yeah, yes the yes sir. there is a short fiction i think all and for the 11th or 12th standard students both in the cbse and the kerala syllabus oh really uh, uh, the, the title uh, i think light is like water something like that oh i don't think like, i don't even remember so it's a be- beautiful I story beautiful story i've read it several times and it's a beautiful story but it looks like very difficult to uh, transact this how we are going to put this into the brains of children that's the difficult thing how we are going to describe to them we are going to make uh-huh. sense of these things that's a problem so uh, it's readable and it's, uh, it's very kind of is it for is it for detail study or non detail yeah it's, uh, yeah it's detail study i think yeah there is only one textbook and it is described in both in cbse i think and there is another text for cbse i don't remember the title but there is another one but i don't know how they are going to process this <laughs> okay uh, can you which story is that can you repeat that the title uh, of the story light uh, light, light is, is like water light is like water okay let me anyway i have the the entire story in my think like and I, i i cannot give you a direct answer straight answer right now uh, without you know, looking at the story i don't know uh, how in fact i didn't even imagine that markets could be there in a school syllabus but i think we have had more his in school syllabus or at least in uh, you know higher secondary uh, syllabus uh, sir one more question raised by Re- grishma uh, can you please explain the significance of urban studies on literature significance of urban studies uh, i can only uh, answer this in one particular way um uh, Yeah, yeah. in fact i raised this particular or i discussed this particular issue when there was a, a, a webinar like this a month back uh, about urbanization um, the novel itself or the growth of the novel itself uh, can be um, read or seen alongside the growth of uh, the city it is generally said that in the 18th century in england uh, the city of london grew in size in every sense of the term it became the, the busiest commercial city uh, with about you know, i think uh, half a million population so that way the growth of the novel coincided with the growth of the uh, the, the city as well look at concepts like the return of the native the return of the native Uh, a figure not only a character uh, or not only a concept in hardy but even uh, a concept that we frequently come across in 19th century literature the return of the native or if you look at um, you know analysis or studies like the ones done by raymond williams uh, 
uh, in whether it is in the long revolution or the country and the city the country and the city is the one in which he actually discusses the the, the distinction or the, the relationship between the countryside and the city or look at a, a poem like the deserted village by oliver goldsmith which actually talks about the the large scale uh, exodus of people from the villages into the cities so we see actually convergence of large numbers of people including ordinary people workers laborers and also uh, writers like even goldsmith himself settled down in uh, the city of london uh, or look at any of the essays written in the 18th century we can see that most of the essays are set in the city of london so urbanization was taking place uh, even as the novel as a literary form was growing Uh, so we can see that even the very concept of the return of the native is associated with urbanization so that way it is related to urban studies uh, young educated people uh, moving into the city seeking employment and coming back to visit their village the home village uh, in a way as a uh, as a uh, as a, a person Uh, who is uh, as an outsider in a way we can even say that he uh, he returns he comes back as an outsider that is actually the figure that you see not only in uh, the deserted village even in the edgerton country church we have a similar figure of a uh, 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 a person uh, living in the city making a visit um, or return back into the village even in milton we have that even in milton uh, we have uh, the the filth of the city being described or the stink in the city described in contrast to the countryside so there are many ways in which or even look at the uh, dickens the entire discan uh, you know uh, 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 all the novels of dickens most of them are all of them are set in the uh, in the city or they are they recreate movement of people from the countryside into the uh, city so maybe that is how you you read raymond williams uh, that would be the maybe the best um, kind of you know theoretical help that you can get um, or you can read even arnold kettle arnold kettle has written extensively about 19th century fiction arnold kettle in two volumes uh, about uh, british literature of the 19th century even in Uh, Raymond Williams uh, work the English novel from Dickens to Lawrence how the English novel in the way evolved uh, after 1848 or maybe in the second half of the 19th century uh, wherein definitely the the focus appears to shift from the rural to the urban uh, thank you sir dr sreehari Uh, the assistant coordinator of the online programs and the faculty of Pioneer College to thank our speaker and the participants. On behalf of LTIF and all uh, here, I extend uh, uh, to Dr. K. M. Krishnan sir for sharing with us his reflections on narrative fiction this evening, sir. Your lecture was. Uh, very much soothing i think i must say it was uh, as comfortable as listening to a musical concert your tone your voice modulation and all was very much comfortable uh, in the days of pandemic you know, we are all <clears throat> having a kind of situation uh, where we don't meet in our real life and we are uh, separated by this uh, global pandemic but once the whole uh, session is over i feel myself very much settled sir because of uh, your approach to uh, uh, this kind of a, a, a platform thank you very much actually i to had wanted to ask certain questions regarding the form and content because uh, but i couldn't because uh, time is running and so uh, you began from the very beginning uh, uh, by quoting look at epic of uh, novel is an epic of a world abandoned by god you know, we are really living in a world of a world abandoned by god and uh, I, i think novel is the best medium to uh, express our issues of the day and 
<coughs> you were touching upon all the uh, yeah, theoreticians right from uh, Lucas to Raymond Williams and it was all comprehensive and uh, I don't know whether if uh, you know we didn't get much time to uh, interact with you the Q&A session was actually uh, it was more I think uh, uh, you know we got more information for more uh, uh, yeah from you from uh, your reference to magic realism uh, Rushdi and all do we have to I think have more deliberations on that I think Marquez also can be taught using that uh, idea the real in the post-colonial nations is totally different from the real in the uh, European nations no? in that way uh, you have already answered uh, to that question I think Marquez can be taught in schools so, no I don't want to prolong because yeah uh, we have to wind up in uh, no time again I thank uh, Dr. K. M. Christian and all of this uh, uh, Dr. Baskanaya, uh, Dr. Praveen, and all of this, and also the participants who uh, were very much patient uh, in listening to uh, this talk. And I once again thank all of you. <laughs>